Welcome everyone and welcome Frank. Thank you so much for joining us today. Um, my name is Caitlin. Um, you guys probably have seen a lot of my emails come out, but I am the co-founder of Pequity. I also used to work at Google on the compensation team with Frank. After Google, I went to Cruise Automation and Instacart where I led their compensation programs. Um, and now I am very focused on my startup, which is helping companies make better pay decisions by automating um, their pay programs for them. Now, as we get into the session, we're super excited to learn more about Frank. Um, I've gotten to talk with him a couple times leading up to the session. I can already tell you he has, I believe, 13 years at Google this week, right, Frank? Uh, 13 and a half this week. 13 and a half years at Google this week. Um, he's seen the company grow from about 12,000 to north of 130,000 employees, so he has a ton that he can share. As we go up throughout this chat, we have a couple topics that we got from you guys when you submitted into the form. But if you have any questions that pop up, please use the QA at the bottom of the screen. Um, my team is on right now, Warren um, and Zach. They'll be helping to moderate and go through and answer any questions um, that you might have for technical issues and also to move questions that Frank and I can answer at the end of the call. Um, and I also want to remind you that this session will be recorded and shared later. So use that discretion when you ask any questions. We'll be really trying to answer things as directly as we can, but if there's very personal or individual questions that come up, um, we'll definitely answer those accordingly, knowing that this will be shared. So Frank, I know I gave you a brief intro there, but I would love if you could introduce yourself to everyone else on the call. Sure, uh, as uh, Caitlin said, I'm Frank and I um, lead the Google Compensation team. Been there quite a while, 13 years, uh, which is a long time in Google years. Uh, it, uh, and it's because of our growth, I, I realize I'm in the top three or four percent of tenured Googlers. So I've been that, that's a long time for Google. Uh, my background is in compensation. I was a consultant at Aon Hewitt in the Hewitt Associates sub uh, before it was acquired, and I was there for many years. I was a partner and a principal, and uh, I did a lot of work in the technology space back then, but also in in other industries as well, uh, and did a combination of broad based and also executive compensation. Uh, when I was scanning the, uh, the, the attendee list uh, and the invitee list, I've seen a lot of uh, familiar names that have crossed my path over the years, people I've worked with in the past. Uh, so it's, it's really good to, to connect with you virtually even though we can't see each other. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> I'm glad to share uh, my experiences. Uh, I, I got into compensation uh, sort of serendipitously because I, I get my, my, my uh, backgrounds in finance and it just so mm -hmm. happened I was one of my folks in the compensation field uh, in my first job, and I thought, hey, that looks pretty interesting. I've never heard of this compensation stuff, and it's numbers and it's people, so maybe I'll go ahead and jump in. And, you know, I've been there ever since. So, uh, um, and hopefully, uh, I've, I've enjoyed it, and hopefully uh, everyone uh, who's in the, in the space is enjoying their time there as well. It's a really an oper impactful opportunity, a great way to influence what's going on in the business. Yeah, and well, and finance is a very traditional path over. And I know when we um, were setting up this session, I asked you what you thought were useful skills to have to get into compensation, and that came up as a key skill set. Yeah, well, it started with the quantitative aspect because you have to have some uh, proclivity toward being quantitative to be facile or at least comfortable with numbers. It's what we do, but you don't have to have advanced math skills and linear algebra or something like that. It, it is good to have a foundation of statistics too. Uh, because yeah. that's really some of the things you have to understand the patterns and data and how to interpret it. So that is a, sort of a core attribute at the, at the baseline. Yes, and it's also very key to those pay equity tests that a lot of people are running right now. So. <laughs> and when your uh, analysts and statisticians are talking to you in like uh, confidence intervals and statistically significant differences, it's really good to have a basic understanding of what that really means. Yeah, and with your background, I mean, you've seen companies small and large and growing and just going through every stage imaginable. So I would love to kind of just start with that and talk about how does compensation differ at startups versus the large companies that you've seen? Well, uh, I think that's, that actually has evolved quite a bit over the last few years and it, it is much different than when I started uh, before the turn of the century, as we, we like to say. <laughs> Back, back in the day, uh, it was so common, uh, and it was a package of very low base salaries, no bonus, stock options, 
uh, and of course they didn't have an accounting charge at that time. Uh, mm -hmm. and, and that has truly evolved over the last maybe 15 years. Of course, stock auction, stock auction expensing is a factor in that process, but still the idea that startups have become so well funded relative to what they were able to uh, get from VCs back 20, 25 years ago it is a sea change in how that is, is evolved. And many of those organizations with actually small workforces and not large workforces who are software oriented, software oriented not hardware oriented and so forth, it, it makes a big difference in your size and scale relative to the number of people. And so what that means is that you can actually pay people fairly well and competitively as opposed to under competitively with a bet on the future with, with actual uh, salaries that are uh, reasonably competitive now. And then, uh, of course, the other piece is that a combination of either options and or stock units depend on wh where you are and, and uh, 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 along the process. Well, I'd say that's almost, um, almost a requirement of most startups these days, right? Like most engineers come in and they're not expecting to leave Google to go down and pay. They're expecting mm -hmm. to go to that startup for the same salary and then a significant upside, hopefully on that equity too. So it's kind of a double dip into the pot. Yeah, and well, and, and uh, the dynamics of the market have, have uh, evolved in that way because there are a number of us who have really good business models. You have ourselves yeah. and Microsoft and Apple and Facebook, which we, we are making a lot of money and uh, <laughs> you know, we, we generally, all of us are targeting at the higher end of the market, we're above the median. Not everybody can afford that. Uh, so mm -hmm. but, but we can, and if you want our kind of our quality of talent, then you've got to compete with companies like us. And that, that's very hard uh, unless you have a super compelling value proposition otherwise, whether it's the product and opportunity for impact uh, and whether there's upside perceived in, the, in your stock and so forth. But uh, if you absent that, uh, then, then it would be very hard to compete against us for talent. Yeah, well, and... That actually goes to another question I kind of have for you. With all these startup structures that are trying to compete, what are some pitfalls? Well, I think the biggest pitfall is just sort of, uh, I think you, you mentioned in one of your posts, uh, the copy and paste. I mean, you just can't copy and paste uh, what, what we can do or Facebook can do, uh, given the level of profitability that we have, broadly. Now, you may be able to adapt our philosophy for a subset of your organization, uh, for maybe the technical part of the organization, depending on uh, you know the, the size of the population, its impact, your funding, and your prospects. Uh, so uh, cutting and pasting doesn't work. So if you're going to if you're going to try to go after good talent, then you've got to be highly selective about uh, the opportunities you you can uh, afford to them. And of course, if you don't have that, then it's got to be the nature of the job and the impact that you have and you know, things that are interesting for people like engineers who like to work on interesting and hard problems. Mm -hmm. And if you don't have that, then, then you've got to have something like culture or other things that people uh, can enjoy and get some satisfaction intrinsically if you're not uh, you know, going to be able to offer all of the extrinsic factors. And, you know, and that lines up very well with what I hear with a lot of startups we consult with because the first question when they see my background is, okay, I want to pay, I want to compete with Google. Like, what do I do to do that? And I always try to explain to them that, you know, it is a competitive stance to take to say we want to target Google, but what does that really mean? Um, and something I like to talk about is, you know, as a large company, there are pitfalls to having to operate in certain ways. So not that they're, you know, when you have a lot of money, it's not a bad pitfall, but what are some complications that you see with large company compensation structures. Yeah, and uh, to, to, uh, let me just uh, add to that question and go back to a thought that occurred to me on your prior comment. Well, yeah, first yeah. is uh, large companies, uh, you, you get to a certain size, and who really has the impact? Uh, does an individual have an impact uh, on, on uh, things? Uh, now, we have, we have the claim that we have eight products now with uh, a billion users each, you can argue that senior engineers really can have a pretty significant amount of impact. But it's really senior individuals as opposed to one individual deep in the bowels of the organization. And so uh, there is risk that you can become sort of slow moving, you don't recognize people at the lower end of the organization and so forth. 
Uh, we try to counter that by allowing lots of performance variation and allow people to move at a faster track than might be typical in other large companies. But many other large companies become slow moving, bureaucratic, sclerotic, right? They, they just don't move very fast. And, uh, and one of the other things that they don't allow in their compensation system is much performance variation. And I'm not talking about four or five of us, but if some organizations say, hey, we can't have more than plus or minus 20% from the norm or from the media. And that, that's pretty a tight performance variation if you're rewarding with compensation. So, uh, you know, we do have a, a higher orientation in performance uh, and we allow uh, variation. We allow people within uh, a job to make maybe uh, one and a half, two X of the median, but or in some select individuals that go beyond that. Uh, but within a continued job, we don't have uh, huge variations. I mean, part of the issue is that do you really that that could be a problem uh, for pay equity as well. So that that is uh, something to consider. No, and I mean, pay equity is top of mind. I mean, it has been for the past couple of years, but I feel this year in particular with everything that's happening in the world, Black Lives Matters, um, a lot of these lawsuits that have come up. What do you recommend for companies to kind of make sure they solve for that? There's always the standard practice of you compare your people, the same role, same level, same performance. Um, but how do you kind of enforce that and build a scalable structure that can achieve true pay equity? Well, I, I tend to think about starting with the basics. I, the most important thing is to have some systematic approach to compensation. You get above 30 or 40 people, you don't know what everybody's doing. Uh, you, you can't use judgment and discretion to set your pay parameters. And my, my belief is that a lot of the pay equity challenges occur in, the, in, in uh, American industry and around the world is uh, companies that don't actually have a systematic approach to their compensation. Uh, so at some point, organizations have to put in some kind of structure and system. And you can argue, well, that's control. Yes, but control for a good purpose. It's pay, pay equity and fairness. Mm -hmm. so, uh, so within the pay sphere itself, putting people and paying people who are doing the same work consistently and fairly and according to legitimate differentiators like performance, like tenure, if that's appropriate or important for you, like skills is great and you should do that. Uh, it is important though in a big picture, particularly in a more sophisticated organization, if you look at uh, the pay system, we can do a pay equity analysis, but we also said what are the legitimate factors or skills or uh, performance, for example. Well, usually performance comes into the factor by having a performance rate. Do you have a fair, equitable, unbiased performance rating system? So that, that is important to, as an input to your system. And then skills. Well, how do we know people uh, doing that job are appropriately allotted or assigned to that job because of the skills capability they have? Just looking at tenure is, I don't think it's sufficient, although that is a bona fide basis uh, uh, yeah. for pay, although I'm not sure it needs to be the, you know, as an organization, we, you can choose to use it, but I would be a little bit reluctant to do that without really understanding, do I really have a good way of assessing skills? And then as people come into the organizations, are we putting at the right level, you know, and make, doing it in a consistent and fair way? Because I think that is the, those are the groundings when people uh, say we don't have a fair and equitable system, they, yeah. they, they, they you know, people will, will determine that by saying, oh, I talked to this person and we graduated from school the same year and therefore, and we're in different levels and we're not paid the same. Well, if you're going to do that as an organization, you should say we're putting you in the mid-level engineer because you don't qualify for being a senior engineer because you don't have the skill set or these capabilities. And when you do that, you know, we'll move you up to the next level. Absent that, individuals can talk to one another and draw incorrect conclusions. And that can get you in a lot of trouble. Well, and I, I would love to know your experience in this, Frank, because even in my um, tenure in the compensation space, I feel like pay equity was always a presence. It was always important. And it's just been gaining steam over these years. And people are paying more and more attention. But I think Google's ahead of the, the curve with it. I'm just curious from your take, you know, has it evolved in your mind and 
what do you think are the factors that are adding to it? Like this year, I think we see, especially with Black Lives Matters, but there's been other things that are feeding in. What do you expect to take? Well, uh, I think that what, what we've done is we become increasingly more sophisticated internally, uh, and not everybody can replicate our, our capabilities. We have uh, people, analysts, and staff who have uh, advanced degrees in statistics who are able to structure the right kind of reports. Clearly, when you're doing these type of things, you know, in all prudence, remember I'm talking this as uh, I'm talking to compensation administrators or people who run mm -hmm. compensation programs. Your responsibility is to make sure that you're doing things fair and equitably, but you you, you want to make sure that you involve uh, your lawyers, uh, whether they're internal or external counsel, because they can guide you in uh, the type of analysis that you can do and to tell what is fair. Even if you believe this is the fair way to achieve pay equity, they may say yes, but the law says X, uh, right? And so doing things uh, in, in that manner. And then uh, we, we do things in a systematic and clear way. We do it right at the conclusion of compensation planning before everything's finalized. So we get all the input from managers, we run the analysis and then make adjustments and then we say, okay managers, uh, here's, here's the updated compensation planning results and some of the data may have changed because we've made some equity adjustments. Uh, and, and that I think is a, is a, a fair, a fair and, a, and an appropriate way to do things. Mm -hmm. One of my colleagues from a very large company, uh, uh, and they've mentioned one of the, they, they do a lot of acquisitions and they said, you know, what really um, is a problem for us is, you know, when do you do the analysis? Because every time we bring in an acquired company, particularly one that doesn't have a good compensation or well-structured compensation system, <laughs> they mess up our results. And so, yep. so we have to go and, and redo things. Uh, and it, in that particular organization focuses salary only, but uh, it, it is important to realize that when you're bringing in lots of new individuals into the company, either by acquisition or by growing, your data set changes. So you have to have a, a periodic review that's consistent you do that every time. Uh, and then finally, as you might imagine, as I mentioned, all the inputs of performance and how people are hired, uh, and so forth at Google, we have hiring committees that set levels, uh, and so and, and so we have committees as opposed to individuals. Yeah. If you mm -hmm. look at the position, many many organizations just say you're the manager, you get to pick what level this person is, and so there should be a review for that process. Yeah. No, and that I mean most of this is music to my ears. A lot of the focus with um, my consulting as well as the programs I build, and even the tool we're building with faculty has been around how do we create a consistent experience across compensation decisions. So providing that peer data, the performance data, um, and I think to your point about decision makers, is making sure that the right people have the right level of transparency. And I know that that's a topic that comes up a lot around, well, what does paid transparency mean? You know, what can I share? Who can I share it with? Does that mean showing all the ranges to all the employees, or do I give it to all of our managers? Um, we have a feature actually within our tool that people can shoot, make that choice of, do I want to show ranges to everyone at the company or just to recruiting? But I'd be curious from your take, how do people make that decision? Like, how do you decide if pay transparency is right for you? Yeah, and I think there, there's, there's, a, there's a continuum when it comes to the pay transparency, right? There's the extreme, like we don't share anything, and uh, then there's the completely open system. I am a little bit reluctant. I don't think uh, open systems are workable uh, unless you have, you don't want performance variation because yeah. uh, it, it, it works in certain, for certain, uh, uh, jobs that are unionized, perhaps they have a scale uh, in certain locations. It's an hourly production type job. You you work there uh, and you and you get bumps every X number of uh, months or years, and th that's a fair and consistent approach and limit because it eliminates the discretion uh, yeah. that comes uh, in the in the process. Uh, so because the challenge of too much transparency is you have to you have to explain variation and differences. And you put mm -hmm. the onus on your manager and hopefully they're able to do that. So many large organizations, in tech, others, they, they publish salary ranges and they often will do that in concert with a policy that says, well, if you perform well and you've been here X number of years, you should be in this section of the range. And if mm -hmm. you perform you know, X three more years, you get to that section of the range. Usually that works very effectively for more stable organizations, 
that they yeah. aren't growing so fast. Uh, they, they're not adding lots of new people each year. And so it's a pretty clear career path. And by publishing, you can actually uh, have a good narrative to employees and, you know, you can gender some uh, employee trust. And I think that yeah. uh, in, in absence of that, then you, you would say like, oh, what if we're growing really fast and people are moving around, uh, so forth. Uh, uh, I think that you have to either have the compensation people in the organization or HR pr practitioners or the managers be able to explain, this is how it works. You know, you're coming in, you're new, you're at the bottom half of the range, typically. And then uh, you might have like 20% upside in salary within your, uh, within your level. And you can get there in the next X number of years if you perform well. And then you move on to the next level. And I think it's fair to share, like in the United States, most Western uh, industrial economies, then, uh, you know, there's a 20, 25 percent between levels. And so people understand that. where it's probably um, and maybe some organizations do this with equity. It's, a, it's a, I don't think they're quite as uh, transparent with equity grants. And, uh, and candidly, we're not yet either. Yeah. Well, I think it's, you know, the thing I often get asked is, like, can I know my range? Can I know, like, what can I get paid if I get promoted and all this information? Um, and I always tell people, I'm not really trying to hide anything. It's just that if they're willing to sit down and get all of the context I have to download from my brain to theirs to make it make sense, right? Because to your point, it's, it's not as easy as there's a range. It's this is the performance that would move you up within it. And these are the other people who are situated within the range who might have been in that role longer and are more tenured, but they're performing better, right? So there's a lot of um, nuance that I like to explain, but it definitely, um, it creates for a tense moment sometimes. And especially right now with COVID, and this is a probably key meaty topic to get to for today, everyone wants to know. They're like, oh, if I move to Nebraska, what's gonna be my pay rate? Can I move to Texas and save more money? Are they gonna reduce my comp at all? Like, what's my company gonna do? So I would love your take on, you know, what do you see happening and what would the frank lens be on how you see COVID shaking out for compensation? Well, it seems that we may have fewer people in high cost of labor locations, perhaps, in whether it's the Bay Area or New York or uh, some Absolutely. of the places around the country. And, and a lot of companies are considering, ourselves included, like should we move more people or have more people outside of those those high high cost areas? And when I say high cost, it's it's you know both uh, it's a from a compensation person's standpoint, it's high pay levels relative to right. others. Generally, you know, we we differentiate uh, salaries and bonus uh, going across by offices, uh, and uh, we're, we're actually not super transparent about it, but considering to be more more open about it. Uh, we, like we don't pay the same in Chicago as we do in the Bay Area, uh, and and uh, th there there is a di difference, and that's true of most large uh, organizations where uh, that that happens. Um, I think that for ourselves, I do see more organizations moving people to places outside of the Bay Area, New York, and so forth, uh, and which is not COVID specific, but maybe it'll it, people feel uh, less of a tie to the Bay Area, and if they yeah. can get projects that they can work on within company facilities uh, in in Chicago or Atlanta or Dallas uh, or other places with uh, uh, lower pay levels, then. People will move there, and hope, you know they're going to be adjusted. That 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 would surprise me if they're not. There is some a lot of discussion uh, of, in smaller organizations, like uh, what if somebody wants to work for Montana? Can they do that? And what do we do? Do we pay them a national average? Do we pay them Bay Area? Uh, mm -hmm. I would think, yeah, I wouldn't pay them. Uh, my own view is that we should adjust for the local labor market if they're working out of that place. And in most cases, they're not going to be actually working from their house. They're not a singleton. Uh, there are extreme examples, of course. We yes. a number of years ago, yeah, we had I, I think someone in our Denmark office wanted to move to Iceland. They were the only person in Iceland. <laughs> they didn't need. They, apparently, they're a high-level IC and individual contributor, and they didn't need to work with anybody else. And they can just go ahead and sit by themselves and crank in, in in their own space and send the results back to Denmark. Well, that that that's different. Most people who are working need to collaborate and work with others, and they're going to do better, particularly in technical sense, if they're co-located to some degree. It doesn't necessarily have to be five days a week. Maybe it's two to three days a week, and you work from home a couple days, and, and, and that works out. 
But in those cases, you're going to pay based on their primary uh, location as opposed to, uh, you know, the, the one who is in some remote location up in the mountains somewhere. And yeah. uh, I just don't think that uh, uh, companies which uh, want to say, say that we're not going to change pay, we're just pay Bay Area, pay anywhere in, the, anywhere in the world, will create inequities within their own organization and they won't have a sustainable business model. Yeah. And there's a couple points in what you just said that I think are amazing and I want to make sure to circle back on. Um, one is on the cost of labor. So that is something that comes up and I think is debated, with especially um, employees, of why do we do cost of labor versus cost of living. And the second piece is more of a question for you on forecasts, but do you think that the cost of labor will change because all these engineers are you know, if they were all to be released from San Francisco and flood to these remote regions, do you think that the comp will change for those regions in general? And so we can answer it separately, but um, feel free to tackle which one first. Let me start with the second one. I, I, you know, you are adding people at the increment. There's already a labor market that exists in many of these locations. And so you're, you're adding, in a way, I think it isn't quite the same metaphor, but you, you have all this housing stock and then you add new developments at the fringe that doesn't necessarily change the cost of housing dramatically across that, that, that area. And so I think it, in any case, it will be, it, it will increase based on the supply and demand that exists in that particular location. And that's going to increase gradually. It is possible if we, uh, it, it, people figure out that, oh, well, Kansas City is a great place to live and you can get housing for one fifth or one sixth of the Bay Area and have a nice lifestyle and you can make 15% or 20% lower salaries or lower total pay, maybe that's mm -hmm. a good place to go and that will increase Kansas City's desirability over time. Uh, yeah. But I think it's going to be gradual and incremental. I think on the other piece of cost of living uh, versus cost of labor, this is one that you know, I, I see misunderstood in the media to a fault. I think that people who write on, on compensation topics or HR topics would have a, a better understanding of it. But I think we all understand that cost of living, especially cost of housing, could vary from national, uh, national average by 6x or maybe 2.5, uh, and it's highly variable, uh, whereas pay levels, don't, particularly salaries, don't vary much more than about 25 or 30 percent from whether it's in the Bay Area down to a national average, down to a place uh, um, like Jackson, Mississippi, or uh, maybe it's Missoula, Montana, or uh, Anchorage, Alaska, or whatever it might be. So there isn't that much variability, and that point, it seems to be lost on the media. And if you actually thought, and it, 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 it's fine if you just want to plunk people down and pay them based off cost of living deltas, but it's not practical if you have people moving back and forth. So to take the extreme example, and I'll use round numbers, if yeah. the Bay Area, San Mateo County or Santa Clara County has a median housing price or cost of living of a uh, million dollars for a house, and it just uses mm -hmm. a example, and uh, Jefferson City, Missouri is 200000 well, you're not going to pay one-fifth in Jefferson City, Missouri, nor if you move somebody from Jefferson City to Sunnyvale, California, you're not going to increase their pay five times. You're going to increase their pay mm -hmm. relative to the national market. Otherwise, you wouldn't have a sustainable approach. So that's, that, that is sort of how I think about uh, the holistic cost of living versus cost of uh, labor. And in most cases, the focus is on uh, housing. However, uh, mm -hmm. tax rates are certainly uh, appropriate. Uh, you know, part of the, the, the high cost of uh, housing uh, could be like food or fuel and and uh, and, and the other types of things that uh, need to be factored into the equation. No, and I think you know when I talk about being able to explain it, I always like to use the example of if we had two engineers in the same role level doing the exact same quality of work, and one side live in downtown San Francisco, pre-COVID in a penthouse with two cars, and another one lived in a studio outside the city with roommates there's obviously a very significant difference in cost of living there, but we're not going to pay the one who has a higher cost of living more if they're doing the same work and pay. And to me, that's cost of labor. Um, cost of living becomes a slippery slope debate and it opens up. I notice when Candace bring it up, it 
it gets into this realm that you just can't work with them, right? It's like, well, I have, you know, dogs and kids or a farm and I want to move here and it's, you know, the expense. And to simplify it for people and to have a truly data-backed approach, cost of labor is just what makes sense. But I do like your housing. I'm probably going to um, borrow your housing example because that definitely resonates quite a bit. Yeah, I, I also think about, I mean, you should pay versus on the value they bring to the organization. Uh, is one, and you will get the, the argument that says my value is the same whether I'm doing the work in Shanghai or Bangalore or the, uh, or the Bay Area, but you would mm-hmm. need to also say that, yes, but we're going to pay what's, you know, at our competitive targeting, uh, which, you know, uh, it goes back to that earlier example, I want to pay like Google. Well, you should, you should pay like where you want to be if we're in the market. And if Google's at the high end, you want to pay like Google, you want to pay like high end, you're going to pay in the middle, like another company, uh, et cetera. You've got to pay in order to, you know, I believe, uh, what, what's appropriate. Otherwise, how are you going to afford to hire more engineers? You can't pay, or you shouldn't pay, in my view, like very wages again in Bangalore, uh, but you can pay uh, aligned with your own philosophy. Uh, and the individual yeah. circumstances is, is the key point. Uh, like people make choices. All, all kinds of things. I we get you get arguments that say, well, uh, we should pay higher because uh, someone came to me and they made a bad choice and they have student loans uh, uh, that are coming due or they had a uh, personal circumstances and yeah. that, that that's good for for us to understand that from a, from maybe structuring our our benefits programs or maybe support on the student loan aspect, but it shouldn't affect like how we. Uh, set their salary, for example, if, if our yeah. philosophy is the pay versus value, pay for performance, and so forth. I completely agree. And, you know, talking about the performance aspect, I think something with COVID that a lot of people have in mind as well is bonuses. Um, you're talking about the exec bonuses to individual bonuses to sales and commission, um, and each of those have their own nuance. But what would you recommend as an approach for people, or what are you looking at when you think about bonus payouts this year? Well, I won't speak uh, on the specifics for Google because we haven't finalized or announced uh, what our pool will be this year. Right, yes. <laughs> currently, it just depend, it depends on how well your business is doing. And I, w- I would say that if you had a, a tough row, and some of the organizations have really taken a hit. Um, you know, uh, my colleagues in, in the uh, hospitality industry are really, really struggling. They've had layoffs. They're not going to have bonus payouts at all. And that reflects the dynamics of their business. You know, we've taken a modest uh, revenue hit in our Q2, but you know, mm-hmm. we had a good ACQ1, and hopefully, we'll recover and we'll be okay. And some of our uh, competitors at at uh, you know the the top end of the the tech market are doing very very well, and they'll probably have a fully generously yeah. program. And it, so, it should be performance oriented, and uh, then it adjusted uh, appropriately. I think there's slightly different when it comes to sales compensation uh, for because, you know, in our particular case, we set quotas for our salespeople every Mm -hmm. quarter, typically, and then we adjust them. And at the end of Q1, we didn't know what to what to do. So, you know, for parts of our business, you know, we paid a target, right? We protected folks. Uh, And uh, other things you can do is uh, what we considered is you, you can put in some quarters like you can set a quota. But then you don't pay any lower than X, 75, 60, 50, 80 percent of quota, and you cap out at the max. You don't go any higher than 120, 150, whatever it might be. So you give, you know, some protection uh, for for uh, uh, the the people who are either unfortunate or they could be just performing poorly. But it could be that uh, things outside their control. So you provide them downside. But then you provide you're protecting against the windfall because you might have said, well, we, we think we're going to reduce quotas uh, in this particular for this particular set of jobs because we think their their clients are going to be suffering and maybe they'll recover super rapidly. You want to create a windfall for them either. So that yeah. those are kind of things when I think about like executive bonuses, uh, which also carry through to the broader workforce and then sales compensation. Yeah. As well. No, and I one last thing I want to discuss before we hop over to QA. Um, you know, something you brought up that I think really matters and it's something that weighs on me when I look at a lot of these companies um, is the individual situations that are affecting people's performance right now. And it's something that I'm discussing with a lot of leaders that we consult with on how are you going to handle this? You know, there's people who have Q2 
kids who can't go to school. So they're at home interrupting the work day. There's people who have sick ones that they have to take care of. There's a lot of stress and fatigue from this general world that we're in right now. Um, so when it comes to comp programs, I know this gets a little bit more into that performance management side, but how are you thinking about this or how are you and the Google team kind of looking at that as a, you know, something that you have to consider in this comp cycle? Well, what we have done for ourselves, and I think it, it, it might be a model that some other companies uh, have followed or, or would be considering. We, we recognize that th this is a place where uh, the, where benefits, uh, you can, whether you call it benefits or performance uh, and compensation may be uh, misaligned and you have to mm -hmm. do what's right for your workforce. We have had lots of folks that have uh, the, the schools for their children or their child care options have been severely curtailed. And so they, they aren't able to do work a full schedule. And so what we did is we expanded our definition of care leave, but you know, both in terms of what qualifies for care leave, you know, not just mm -hmm. a sick kid or a sick parent, but sort of taking care of folks. And we expanded from a 12 to 14 month amount that people can take in as few as hourly increments. So, uh, so that's one way that we supported them. And we also asked managers to adjust performance expectations to reflect the lower ability to contribute. So if people can only contribute to 80%, then uh, we expected they could produce 80% of the normal uh, uh, workflow or work output. And we, we have asked managers to document that so that can be brought into appropriately into performance review discussions, performance ratings, because that feeds into compensation. So, you know, we've done some things more from a supportive si uh, side of things uh, to, to allow uh, people to uh, be able to deal with some personal challenges, you know, and then we'll continue to review that because it, we, we don't know, uh, it, it'll vary across the uh, organization. There are some school districts that are going back. I, I was actually uh, down the street here in Newport Beach. I saw uh, a kid on his bike uh, in the back path looked like, looked like a high school kid, and I was thinking, he oh. must be going to school. I don't, where is he going? <laughs> and so, you know, uh, so I, I assume that some schools are open, and even here. So um, uh, it, it, the circumstances vary, and doing what you can to support people in, in, in an intermediate or short-term period is certainly mm -hmm. a good idea. And then you can figure out what all need to figure out what to do going forward, uh, you know, as things uh, evolve, and we, I believe they will be somewhat variant across geographies and, and uh, locales. Wow, and man, talk about putting the pressure on the rest of us, giving hourly increments for <laughs> the time for the care leave. That's amazing. Well, you know, I think, you know, Caitlin, because you worked, you worked in the Google Comp team, that, we, you know, we do our bonuses uh, we on a daily basis. You know, we do a daily yes. calculation. And so, you know, like two hours care leave at, at Target and six hours. Uh, and, oh, you know, wow. <laughs> so yeah, uh, yeah, it, it uh, it'll be a challenge for for our, our for our comp planning team to do all the details. Setting the bar high, but I like we'll try to rise the challenge. I like it. Um, and now I'm really excited. To, we get to turn over to QA for everyone on the call. If you want to add questions, again, you can click on the QA button at the bottom. I see we have some pending here. Um, you can also feel free to chat it over in the chat to Warren and he can make sure to get that to me and Frank. So Frank, um, I'm going to start here. So there's a new law, Caitlin and Frank, in Colorado starting January 1st that will require pay ranges to be included in all job postings, a step beyond California's reasonable request law. Do you see a time where pay ranges are more universally available for all companies? Uh, I would say uh, Universally, I, 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 I think that's probably a long way off and if you can predict like 15 years or 20 years in the future. I do think that over the next uh, three to five years, we're going to have a lot of other states that are going to be requiring that. We're going to have to do something special for because uh, we have a large Boulder office and we mm -hmm. will be doing something in the state of Colorado. Uh, and I think that is certainly a, it is a trend we're going to see. I think we can probably predict it uh, would be places who are more employer uh, employee friendly, Massachusetts, New York, potentially Washington State, Oregon, California um, are, are, are more likely to have those, uh, those types of arrangements. Yeah. And uh, I think that the question there, like there are some locations where we're doing internationally where there is some posting requirements in Singapore and in Australia, for example. 
Uh, and yep. uh, we're doing that, but we don't post the whole range. We post exactly. uh, the minimum or hiring range, uh, and uh, uh, that's worked in those circumstances. Uh, but you know, it's going to vary what we do in each location. Yeah, and I think that um, you know, to chat on this one, we a couple of companies that I'm working with are considering this, and we are looking at whether we roll it out for the whole company. I think it depends on company size. Most of the companies are around 300 to a thousand employees. I think who are working on it right now and have a presidents in Colorado. Um, but if it were to be that direction where a lot of companies were able to say, we'll do it for everyone in the company, sure, I think universal may become something more of a thing. Uh, but to Frank, your point on that, we are looking at it as what is a reasonable range. Because whenever these laws come out, that's the first thing I wonder. Like, what what constitutes reasonable, right? So that'll be the question to be answered. The next question, Frank, that we have is, do you feel that perfectly equitable decisions can only be made if there's no manager discretion in the decision-making process, assuming algorithms take into account acceptable reasons for deviation, like performance, skills, and tenure, et cetera? If you were able to, I actually think that would be uh, not the only perf uh, equitable way to do it. That would be a perfectly equitable way to do it if you were able to capture everything. Actually, what we would love to do, because we allow some discretion in, in mm -hmm. our system, uh, but we ask managers to justify its application. Uh, but the, if we were able to document the perfect rationale of skills, retention, performance, you know, and whatever we think is valuable uh, or appropriate to include it in as, as a, uh, uh, a basis for discretion or judgment, then we'd, like, we'd love to include it in a formula. Absent that, because I think it's going to be a long time before we get the perfect model to do that or algorithm, then what I would say is then you need to limit discretion as, uh, to a reasonable amount, a small amount. So that's one of the things that we're trying to do is uh, anchor managers where you know, one of the things we're considering is uh, we have an acceptable range past our we propose an, a proposed amount based off performance and the role. Uh, and if managers go outside that, we, we ask for uh, a requiring note. But maybe we need to compress those ranges a little bit and uh, maybe even have a hard stop lower and higher uh, past adjustment that, that will actually prevent them from going too far. Because it is that discretion that will, uh, uh, may result in, in uh, pay equity challenges. Well, and I think you'll be able to relate to this too, Frank, because I think there was an experiment done when I was at Google. But when I went to Cruise, we actually tried to create a purely algorithmic offer process, where it was like if they had this score and this thing and these are the factors that we would move on. Um, at the end of the test, I tried to see how accurate did it come out. Were people truly equitably paid based on the algorithm? And I think GitLab had a similar issue, but my answer was no. There's still a deviation, and it came down to negotiation and uh, people being more willing to stretch the truth on their resumes, right? And I think that was GitLab's issue as well. Um, they found that male submitters to their um, offer system would tend to sway towards the higher end of their experience, whereas women uh, would tend to sway towards the lower end of their experience. And it was just a personal bias of entering it. Um, and that's something that I think about a lot whenever we talk about this, because I want a world that's purely algorithmic, but I almost don't even trust it because of the way that humans use it. Like Anything with humans causes those discrepancies. Yeah, I also think that uh, to, to the point, like you have to have a good input. So if you have a falsified input coming in, then you're going to have a, a bad output going out. Uh, yeah. Yeah, and so that that uh, certainly uh, is a, a, a valid consideration for sure. And one of the other things to do is, uh, I'm you know expectations is allowed under California law, for example, as you know, uh, for offers. And I'm wondering if we should be even asking expectations. Maybe we should just anchor people on the low end and say this is this is our baseline rate. We'll we'll tweak from there. But uh, that way we don't get into uh, a high-end negotiation, but we compress the, the reasonable range of when negotiations could actually occur. Yeah, no, I love that. And that kind of shifts into a bit about like performance management there. Um, the next question is, with the ground shift in perf management and the move away from performance ratings, many organizations are struggling to communicate to employees and justify pay decisions. Do you still believe OKRs are the way to go? Uh, well. I see that's Chad Atwell. So, uh, hi, Chad. How you doing? <laughs> Good to you, Chad. Uh, so, uh, I think that uh, what I would say is that I'm not sure it's a good thing to get away from performance ratings per se. You have to have, I'd like to see some input. I'm not sure that uh, 
that that having no performance rating or performance feedback is good. If you don't have that, then you don't have it in your in your comp system. Then how do you differentiate for performance? Which I think there's risk mm -hmm. of tail challenges. Uh, I, I'd actually think that having uh, simpler or clearer and basic uh, approaches uh, uh, to performance management are a good way to go. And uh, whether it's OKRs or any type of goal, we should hold people accountable for output. So how you hold people accountable for output, I think, is, is important. And I, I, I still believe we should have uh, uh, what you call it OKRs or goals as the basis for assessing performance or expectations, whatever you want to call it. Well, and to your point on that too, I mean, we something that we considered when we were building out a lot of these processes in our tool, um, it goes back to your point on you have to record every reason that deviates from something, and it has to be on the basis of like experience, performance, tenure, or role related. Um, and a lot of the current shift, I think, from performance ratings is that people are, don't assign a number to people, and there's a lot of debate over whether they're fair or anything like that but we still need an input. Like we need to have something to put into them. Um, so every place I've gone, we've currently gone through the process of implementing some sort of OKR or measurement. Um, but I do wonder if the performance ratings themselves will change if we start to get away from the below meets exceeds and all of that, or if we'll start to say, you know, what percentage of time does this person meet their goals? Um, I've seen a couple of programs pop up around that, but I think it's a great question. And I really would love to see where we get to go with that performance role. The next question that we have on here is, how do you see local cost of labor comparisons changing as remote becomes its own cost of labor category? It seems the geo arbitrage can only work for so long as we go more and more remote. Well, I think that, you know, for, for us, we, we actually have a category called remote, and we basically pay them a U.S. national average, mm -hmm. uh, but maybe that's too generous, and maybe we should have uh, something that is, uh, and we're, we're certainly uh, planning to look at this, which is maybe we should have the nearest metro area or we, we, we're not going to go to a zip code. You know, the, there are a lot of companies in the, in like chain restaurant association, they used to do a survey, you know, by zip code. So you can get data by zip code. I don't, that, that's not the characteristic of generally the kind of companies that are probably on this call. Uh, but yeah. having something that's tied to location, I think is, is important. Yes. By zip code, I can confirm. I've had to do it for Instacart. Not fun. <laughs> so we do it for shoppers only, though, I can say. Um, next question here from Zahir. So hi, Frank. How do you think the bull stock market has affected compensation over the past few years? And what are your thoughts on how a recession may impact compensation? Yeah, unclear, unclear to me uh, how what will happen if, if will the recession turn into a bear market or not. Uh, there's a lot of other uh, competing factors there. I think what's happened with the, the bull market is that people who have stock have un completely unreasonable expectations about uh, the way stock, their stock's going to perform in the future, right? That, uh, I, I think that most humans will simplify things using Occam's razor and just do linear extrapolation. Uh, you know, if it's been going up like 20% a year or 40% a year, I should just, that, that means it's going to be 40 and 40. And I think that, that we see that in offers because people assume that. Uh, that, that their current company stock is going to actually be expanding by that much. We have the advantage that oh, well, our, ours is going up pretty, pretty, pretty well, and so we can sort of offset that. But if you're an organization that uh, um, has flat stock or declining stock most recently compared to a high flyer, you're going to have a hard time ever hiring that, that individual. I do think that in, in the, in, with a recession in the short term, we're definitely going to have lower bonus payouts. We're going to have lower merit increases. And I, I think that there will, uh, to go back to uh, my earlier point, it will probably strengthen the organizations that with good business models and uh, the more aggressive, the ability to pay more. So, for example, there's a number of companies, uh, I would actually call it the bimodal tech distribution, that there's like the top end of the market in our, in our cells, like Facebook and Netflix and Apple and Amazon and Microsoft and so forth. And there's folks in the middle and uh, and toward the end, I won't name too many names, but, you know, they're, they're just not able to compete. And in the case of a recession, you know, uh, uh, to pick a, pick a name, like if you're somebody working at, if you're in United Airlines, to pick a name, or let me pick a hotel chain, Marriott, you know, you're not going to be able to hire anybody currently from uh, like a big tech company that's in, in the top end of the market. You're just not going to be able to do that unless it's like three levels up in the organization and provides a good career challenge. 
So uh, we just have to understand that there, there's uh, uh, a big hit, and that hit is going to be bigger for some types of companies than others. Yeah, and I think the key point that I almost want to draw out of what you're saying right there, Frank, is it might change the way that we have to explain comp. Because I think a lot of startups especially, they like to show that 40% growth, and they act like it's going to be consistent year over year, and they have those calculators that just show a hockey stick on everyone's value. And that might be true, but in the current market, there might be a lot of startups where that isn't. And it's not that you don't want to sell the dream, but if you want to be setting realistic expectations with your employees, you might have to reconsider how you communicate those things knowing your own company's market. But I think that's going to be, to your point, in that bimodal um, model, it depends on which side of the model that you're sitting on. Um, next question that we have, by the way, from Kevin. How do you see things like company culture being impacted due to COVID, and how might companies work to keep that consistent despite virtual work? So more of a culture. Uh, yeah, uh, well, I, I actually think that, like, for example, we have a unique culture, distinct. Uh, it's you know, collaborative and uh, lots of idea exchange and so forth. And it, that paradigm is going to affect how we get people back in the office and why we won't, we won't go to a completely uh, remote workforce. You know, we, we're going to have people assigned to an office of, in some way, shape, or form. And how many days they work there, uh, you know, that will be fleshed out. But I think, you know, eventually we'll be back in offices in good size and people will make the connection and I think that will re-engage in uh, our culture. I do believe that there will be more like manager in one office, people in another office, or teams mm -hmm. collaborating across offices. So having a good infrastructure to promote it. Um, I'm actually looking and hoping that someday in the future we'll have like holograms and, and so it'll feel oh, like even when you're on the PVC we'll actually have like like a visual representation of the person across the table. And I think oh, maybe that's wow. the same kind of feeling. Uh, but in the absence <laughs> of that, I, I do think that uh, uh, getting back to the office will uh, reignite company culture. And, you know, having a bunch of singletons everywhere, that will only work for a company where culture isn't important and mm -hmm. the work is productive of individuals spread out working as singletons. Yeah. You're living in the next century already, Frank. Holograms and <laughs> I agree. Oh, and um, we have another question that came in the chat, so more posted. Thank you. Um, how have you seen survey companies respond to the topic of remote pay in the way they collect and aggregate the data? Well, I, I think that generally what we've seen is that we're. I haven't seen organizations like uh, or survey organizations provide here's data for remote. It's, it's still in a geo area uh, that they're doing it, and I, I think that's appropriate mm -hmm. uh, and so forth. I don't think that remote should be its own category. Yeah. Well, and I've heard, I've heard rumors, and I'll let the group hear, that Radford's doing something to speed up their collection of data in response to COVID. I haven't seen anything personally yet, but I think that companies are becoming more aware that timely data might be useful. Um, there's a trade-off, of course, where I don't personally want to go in and change my comp structures like every quarter just because the market's moving. I kind of want to choose a stance to offer some stability to the employees. But I have heard that there might be a movement towards that um, with some of these companies. Mm -hmm. So Eliza Bernard asked, hi, Frank, beyond reducing overall headcount cost, is there any other rationale for reducing comp for geography relocations? Well, I think it's, uh, there's a couple of things. One is it, it's fair, right? It's, it's fair to individuals. Uh, and so I assume that if you're going from A to B, you have to move somebody from A to B. You already have employees there in option B, so you want to have pay fair for the people in that location relative to their peers. It's also uh, a responsible thing because we're, we're actually saying that we want to, you have a market target and we have a governance role in the compensation field. You, you should pay people aligned with how you pay versus market. And if you don't change, uh, when you when you relocate to a different market, then you're not aligned to market. That could be your philosophy not to be aligned to market. You just have to be conscious about it. And thirdly, I would say it needs to be symmetrical. You, you know, you go from A to B, uh, then you get moved down to B. From B to A, you, go, you get moved up to A, and, and you're being fair and consistent. And I think that people understand that message. So. And the next question we have is very specific, so I think you can answer general if you want to. Um, but 
It's more of a question on the practice at Google. Google announced that its offices will remain closed until next summer. Is the company adjusting anyone's pay during this period? For example, if a Mountain View employee works remotely for the next year from India, is their pay being adjusted? If not, how do you handle the discrepancy between their pay and that of your local India employees in the same function? Yeah, I, with, with the, the limitations on travel, I'm not sure we actually have that circumstance. It's pretty possible. Mm -hmm. Generally, what we're doing is we're keeping people uh, uh, tied to their home office pay uh, mm -hmm. currently. Uh, and hi to Bob, because a former Googler as well. Uh, so <laughs> we're doing well, Bob. Uh, and uh, of course, what we, we are also doing is uh, to the degree uh, that people aren't able to travel, you know, we are uh, essentially paying their destination place, uh, except if they're in, uh, in not in the same country, we'll, we'll, localize, uh, we'll localize that. And I think um, this question has come up quite a bit. So for some market intel for anyone who's interested, a lot of companies I know are choosing not to localize at the moment. It's helpful. Um, I've heard a lot of other companies following suit. So the next question we have here is, how does work in an acquisition, e.g. if a large comp tech company acquires a smaller startup, um, how does that work, especially if there's huge pay discrepancies? Well, what we do is we try to normalize them. We try to move them onto the Google structure as, as soon as possible. Uh, and I think that would be the appropriate thing to do in most cases. That should be a factor in your deal as you think about the cost changes. Uh, because if you, if you actually are going to co-locate them with everybody else, that means you're, there's discrepancies, and I'm assuming the discrepancies are on the low side. Uh, that's the easier but more costly thing. You just have to bring people up to, to whatever, some modicum or, or the minimum plus uh, some differentiation is what we recommend uh, in that particular case. Unless, of course, that, that you, know, you said small, but... If you're going to acquire like a subsidiary like we did at Motorola uh, many years back, we kept them as separate and they had their own pay system. But generally, we're you know we we assume you're going to integrate them. Uh, I imagine the other challenge would be, well, what if they're more highly paid uh, than folks? I would try to put more of the pay if you could change pay structure more in uh, um, more consistent or bring them in on consistent salaries because that's fixed. And if you're going to give more pay, then you should put it in uh, uh, equity or stock so that it, it actually invests and diminishes over time and extinguishes, or even sign on uh, type uh, awards. Like you convert uh, and put them and give them large uh, M&A cash payments at, at the time of the acquisition close, at a year out, a two year out, and make it also be uh, a retentive approach. So you're moving people onto your company structure as soon as possible. Yeah. And I know we're at times, so I don't want to go too much of your night, Frank, but I think there's a fun last question to ask you here. So, Frank, what do you find most challenging about your job at Google? And I would also like to add, what do you find most rewarding? Uh, maybe it's a, the flip side of the same coin. Uh, the, the most challenging thing about, uh, the, the, about working at Google is uh, we're growing and changing, uh, and so that gives us lots of challenges. We're uh, increasing in size like 15, 20 percent a year. We're getting into new businesses. New businesses want new things. Generally, uh, the, the businesses always want to customize, and but we have sort of a consistent talent philosophy. We want to move people across the organization. So there's uh, the impetus is is to expand and to uh, customize and do differently. Sort of like I, I actually think of some model of the universe throwing planets out who want to do their own thing. And our role is to is to actually use the the forces uh, that we have to to do the right thing for the business and solve for Google because that that generally means consistency. But there there's room for principles exceptions uh, in many cases. Uh, I think the most uh, appealing thing about Google continues to be that we've made a practice of hiring really excellent people. Uh, mm -hmm. and, uh, Caitlin, uh, you're an example. You worked on the compensation team. You were in Google. <laughs> uh, we we have lots of great people on the Google compensation team, uh, and it, it's really a pleasure to work with great people who you can depend on, who have great ideas, uh, who uh, can be supportive, uh, who uh, uh, are just a great uh, great folks with whom to interact. So those, that's the thing that I, I actually enjoy most about Google. Um, <laughs> 
I miss the team too. I'm happy we could connect today on this. Um, and for everyone on the call, thank you for joining. Uh, we had some great attendees from I see that we had Airbnb, Pinterest, Google, LinkedIn, Genentech, Cruise. Uh, I could list on and on. There's a lot of great companies that came on today, so really appreciate. If anyone has questions for me or Frank, uh, feel free to email Warnick at Pequity. If you have questions on Pequity and the tool that we're building, we're trying to address all the pay dilemmas that you heard us talk about today from setting geo differentials, making offers, to handling promo and merit, all with the compensa compensation person lens, but also for the non-comp planner on your teams. Um, and Frank, is there anything else you'd like to say to the group before we sign off? Well, I would just like to say, hopefully this was uh, informative and helpful, uh, and we shared some information that would help you in your jobs. So uh, hopefully uh, you know, it's a, you'll have a positive uh, reaction to this. And of course, uh, as uh, Caitlin mentioned, uh, happy to answer any follow-up questions you have. And to all the people that uh, I know and didn't get a chance to call out specifically, I saw there's a lot of uh, familiar names on the on the uh, attendee list. Uh, good to, good to hear you. Uh, good to see your names, and uh, hopefully we'll connect soon live. Yes. And thank you, Caitlin, awesome. and your colleagues. Uh, no, thank you. All right, have a great night, Frank, and thank you to everyone else too. Okay. Bye bye.